If you love classic contemporary Christian music and the people that made it, please like this video and subscribe to our channel to help support us and keep us going. This is Stage Right, and I am your host, John Thorne. They say if you die with a handful of friends, you die a rich man. Well, I have several buses full, and I'm very excited to share them all with you. Welcome to Stage Right. I am your host, John Thorne. I appreciate you taking time to listen today. So if you go to the Stage Right with John Thorne Facebook page, you'll see I posted a screenshot this week of all of the downloads for just this past week and the global reach that we've accomplished. I'm really excited about this because 25% of our audience is from outside the United States, which is just wild. It makes me smile and shake my head all at the same time. I can't believe that you can actually reach the world from your studio and your family room. It's kind of crazy. So what I want to ask you to do, when you go to the Facebook page, scroll down to the post with the screenshot that's got the map on it. And I want you in the comments section to leave your name and where you're listening to the show from. And if there's any feedback for any of the episodes or if you want to send a message to any of my guests or whatever... You can post them there or go to john at stagerightpodcast.com, john at stagerightpodcast.com, and send us some feedback. Let us know what guests you like. Let us know where you live, where you're listening from. We want to know as much about you as you want to share. So you can go to the Facebook page, Stage Right it with John Thorne, or you can john at stagerightpodcast.com, email me. Love to hear from you. Everyone that's part of the show would like to know how you're doing and where you're from. And uh, I'll pass any messages you have on to any of my guests, or you can just let us know what you think and uh, what you're enjoying about the show. It's pretty wild. This podcast journey has been crazy for a lot of reasons, but the biggest thing about it for me is I am constantly reminded of how much I truly care about all of my guests. They really are friends. They're not just random people that uh, I met or got to know. They're truly people that I care about. I was on a call this week with next week's guest, Andy from For Him, and it felt like we were riding the bus heading to a concert tonight. With all of these guys, it feels like time stands still when we're not together. One moment we're together, then we pause time, five years goes by, then we unpause time, and we talk, and things are as if we'd been together the whole time. Truly meaningful friendships that are only forged out of a unique life experience and the intense circumstance that squeezes the best out of all of us. My guest today is one of the best friends I've ever had in my life. Paul Salveson, Grammy Award winner, Dove Award winner, mix engineer and producer, will be joining me in just a minute. But first, a word from our sponsor, Hey Rockstar. Hey Rockstar provides digital marketing software and services to generate more leads, more exposure, and more revenue for your business or organization. Let Hey Rockstar amplify your awesomeness. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, he does not write the songs that make the whole world sing, but he makes them <laughs> but he makes them all sound better. <laughs> Mr. Paul Salveson, hey Salvo, what's up? Hey, how you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Okay, so that reminds me. You, you've got to give me a movie phone. Do the movie phone voice with the voicemail that you used to have for us when we lived together. The movie phone voice? Well, I haven't done that in a while, and I actually haven't smoked a cigar lately, so I can't get too low. But what movie were you wanting to see? Uh, the the The... You did the voicemail on the phone that, that was the uh, Ringo George thing. The Ringo George thing? John Paul Ringo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. I totally forgot about that. I don't remember that. Our, vo our, our voicemail was in the in the movie <laughs> phone guy voice was, yeah. you've reached John Paul Ringo and George. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was one of the funniest yeah. things ever. So, anyways, all right. So I know all the answers to all these questions because we've talked. You do. We've talked for years. <laughs> you can pass the test. But your people don't know the answers to all these questions, but they will at the end of this podcast. So tell everyone where you grew up, where you got your start. Oh, okay. Well, I grew up in Chicago, Chicago area. Um, I I graduated from high school early and didn't know what to do. So I thought it would be cool to do computer engineering. So I took a year of that and absolutely hated it because I didn't realize it was all math. <laughs> <laughs> Till I was halfway through the semester. Um, but so then I went to uh, 19, I had a neighbor that had a, his dad had a band and they needed like a sound engineer to come to the bar and just kind of run the sound. And um, the name of the band was K Ace and it was the summer of 1983. And so I would follow them around and uh, it actually the, the legal age at the time was 21. So they'd have to sneak me in and I would run sound and I'd add a little verb to their vocals or echo and they would just, they would totally love it. And um, through that, I found an adult learning course that was at the junior college for recording engineer. And it kind of, I took that little course in the summer it wet my appetite because you know I, you know when you're growing up you're always listening to records. I mean everybody's kind of has the same story. They love music, listen to records. Everything. And I was like, I never thought about recording, so I took that course and it kind of freaked my interest. And so I ended up going to the recording workshop that fall, and um, it was like a six weeks intensive course. And at that time, there was only like two or three places in the whole country that offered recording engineering and you know now it's like everybody offers it right. you know and there's literally no jobs so it's kind of stupid but right <laughs> um so so i took that course and in that fall i finished i went back to chicago and i applied at every um studio in chicago that i could find and i got i got one interview with Chicago Recording Company, at the time, there were two major complexes in Chicago. It was Universal and Chicago Recording Company. And each of them had like 10, 12 studios in their complex. So they had stuff for editing, voiceovers, and then they had full-blown recording studios and mastering rooms and all kinds of stuff. So I got an interview, and um, I just kept calling them like every day, every day. I didn't hear from them. And uh, as a actually a story I just recently told my kids about being um, about persevering. And cause they're like, I don't know if I should call. I'm like, just keep calling. Right. You know? <laughs> so I bothered, I bothered them. I don't know. It went on a few couple, two or three weeks. And finally, you are like, we'll call you in a something. And I'm like, okay, okay. Whether, and then I wait two days, call again, call again. And I got annoyed with me, but um, so I finally, uh, they hired me and I was, uh, an assistant, more of a runner. Mm -hmm. at, you know, back in those days, you started cleaning toilets and um, and just doing errands, picking up food. You know, yeah. going to the grocery store and buying cases of beer and all kinds of stuff. Anyways, um, within a few months, I kind of this guy had. Uh, on the music shift. So during the day they did commercials like Budweiser and McDonald's and United back then the jingles were really popular, you know, mm -hmm. United airlines and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. um, that was during the day and it was high pressure, high dollars, whatever. And then at night bands would come in and, you know, they'd start around dinner time and then go to four or five in the morning or whatever. So this engineer befriended me on the night shift because it was kind of my, my um, duty was to kind of take care of all the studios at night. I'd go around and empty the garbage cans, make sure nobody was stealing anything. Right. Um, get, get, you know, I would make cassettes for people that were ordered during the day or whatever. Just mm -hmm. did a bunch of various things. Well, an engineer kind of, he took me under his wing and started showing me more advanced stuff, how to record and use compressors and all that kind of stuff and so after a few i mean within a few months 
uh, I think I was hired somewhere around October, November. And by February and March, I actually, so this is what was pretty funny in high school, junior high and high school, I was a huge sticks fan, like massive sticks <laughs> fan. And I had like all their, every vinyl record they ever made. And <clears throat> I knew all the songs and everything. Well, within four months of getting this job, I happened to be working on Tommy Shaw's solo rec- first solo record. <laughs> oh, dude! <laughs> and I was beside myself because he, you know, he was in Sticks. He kind of made Sticks between him and Dennis DeYoung. You know, that was, it was like a big deal. So right, especially in the Midwest. Oh, in the, yeah, in the Midwest, they were. They, I mean, Sticks even had a plane, which was one of the. They were. I don't know if they were one of the first bands to ever have to have their own plane, but it was like a big deal. So. I had to try to keep my cool anytime he was around because <laughs> <laughs> I was such a starstruck. But what was funny is we started working on that, and uh, you know I was just a, like a, I was I was a assistant to the assistant. I wasn't even really doing anything. But so for a couple of years, I got to I was there a couple of years, and and you know that was the early '80s. So it was at that time drug, sex, and rock and roll it was really crazy, and. Right. There's a lot of bands that came through there, uh, Survivor and, uh, you know, Tommy Shaw, of course, Johnny Winters. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of oh, Cheap Trick hmm. and all, all these, you know, Midwest kind of rock and roll. And also, uh, I also did a lot of work on R&B stuff. There was a producer, Tom Tom, uh, at the time, his name was Tom Tom 84. Hmm. And he did all the horn arrangements for Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Phil Collins, and Genesis, and stuff like that. And he would come in and produce at night. Right on. And those were always really cool sessions Cool. Uh, to be a part of. So that kind of laid the foundation of it. But after I was there a couple of years, you know, I was turning 20. I was, uh, I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm getting old. <laughs> Uh, turning 20, 21, I was like, I better go back to school before I end up dead in the gutter, you know, because, um, you know, I mean, it was, it was not a big deal. There was a lot of, everybody smoked pot. There was a lot of cocaine back then. Right. Um, and it was just a a crazy must. And, And actually the engineer that I, uh, would always assist, um, this is how I actually got a lot of my experience at such a young age is we would st- he would start the sessions and by 10 11 o'clock at night he was already drunk and half out of his mind mm. uh on coke and he would end up sitting he was par- he would get paranoid and he'd end up sitting there watching the security door and i would basically then kind of take over the session babysit the session oh, wow. until they were done right and then i would drive him home <laughs> and then drive myself home and then turn around and do it all over the next day so that that really kind of gave me the foundation of my career is that that couple of years there and then from there I went on to back to school for a couple of years and I was a sound engineer there at the school and actually a student taught a class in uh, audio engineering 101 for the broadcasting department which oh, was a lot great. of fun <laughs> And um, basically, all my friends took the course. <laughs> Professor Salveson. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. So, and then I moved to Nashville uh, in '87, and basically started, you know, started my restarted my career in in the new city in '87. So that's about the time we met. Then, right, we met around '89. '89, right? summer of '89, we we met. Um, summer of 89 <laughs> there's no songs about that summer you need to write one <laughs> you know what maybe i should it'll involve headlights the first night i ever met you yeah, headlights that's right Mar- margaret becker was doing a concert in lansing michigan yeah and the promoter didn't have any sense so he booked an outside concert for the summer and when the sun went down you couldn't see anything because he had no lighting rig <laughs> and so all the sun goes down <laughs> so do you remember what they did oh yeah we were like in a um it was a park and somehow there was like a it was enough of a natural bowl that they pulled the cars on yeah the... yeah that, that's what it was a bowl and they they parked all their cars around the edge of the bowl and shined their headlights on the 
on the uh, stage. It was crazy. <laughs> Margaret played like the last half of the concert in the dark with headlights shining on. Them. <laughs> yeah. And that was that was the night Jackie Street introduced me to you and Kip and Margaret. But that was the night I met you was in Lansing. Ooh, that's crazy. When you moved to Nashville, how did you end up getting hooked up with Margaret? Golly, you know, I don't even know. That's a good question. Um, how in the world? Because I know if it hadn't been for Margaret and Jackie and Kip, I would have never met you. Well, possibly never met you. And even if we had met, we wouldn't have become the good friends that we are. I don't remember how I actually got that gig. I know, I know about that same time. Boy, how would I have met? Oh, you've totally stumped me on that. Was it through, like, Peter York or anything? I don't know. No, no, I didn't come in up Peter York until later. Um, dang, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't. That is a crazy question. I'm going to have to talk to Margaret about that. <laughs> that's funny. Um, You do know that's over 30 years ago, so you got to give me a break. <laughs> 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 well, dude, I'm older than you. You need to take your ginkgo beloga. Well, I'm trying to remember how I would have gotten the first gig. I mean, I don't know. I didn't know anybody. I would, I didn't know anybody um, unless it was through Jackie somehow. Uh, Jackie, you know, recommended me or something. I, I don't know, man. That's crazy. Had you worked with him maybe in a studio session or something? Well, Jackie also played for Paul Smith. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Around the same time, um, I had been in the studio with Paul Smith because um, I had some friends that we, we, we built, a, built a studio in Berry Hill in Nashville. I remember that. So I met Paul, and Jackie played for Paul some. So, yeah, I had probably done some sessions with Jackie, and that may have been the connection somehow. Uh, also, my wife at the time had um, was going out on the road with Paul oh, yeah. Smith and doing concerts. So somehow in that whole uh, entourage or, you know, Joe Hogue had been working with Paul Smith, too. And I knew Joe Hogue uh, through some other friends and he was one of the partners in the studio. So I don't know. It was it, it we had a circle of friends that all kind of started working and then. And then everybody would get everybody else a gig or do something, you know. Okay, so let's let's don't skip over this. Okay. So when you owned the studio, you had a studio with Chris Thomason, mm -hmm. Joe Hogue, and yeah, Mark Baldwin, me, Joe Hogue, Mark Baldwin, and um, Brett Teagarden. Teagarden, yep. And, yeah, and Brett Brett kind of ran it. Um, we we initially had it up in White's Creek in a house guest house up there. And then we moved it to Berry Hill is what we did. And then we actually did quite a few records in that room. Uh, Jonathan David Brown worked in there with Brett. Um, I know we did uh, some Paul Smith stuff. We did a bunch of Chris Thomason and I who ended up running uh, the creative department for Integrity in the 90s. Yeah. In the early 2000s, him and I had a production team. We did a lot of custom records and got people record deals. And then, um, uh, oh, and, and Larnell Harris. We did a Larnell ha Harris record there. Oh, cool. Joe produced. And then th that actually ended up being the very first record that I, as a, as a mix, I was hired outside to be a mix engineer. So most of the records up until that point that, that I worked on, I recorded or, or, or produced and mixed. And, and so no one had hired me as a, just a mix engineer. And so that Larnell Harris record, I choose joy was the first record that actually was hired as a mix engineer and mixed the whole record. So Ken Pennell over at, uh, at the time, I think he was at Benson. Now he runs, he runs Motown gospel kind of took a chance on me. And that was the first record that I mixed completely as a mix engineer. So, all right. So do this real quick. Give everyone like a, a one minute description of the differences between mixing live and mixing for a record. <laughs> <laughs> one minute, ready, go. <laughs> well, okay. So in a on, in a live mix situation, right? You're uh, you're in a 
um, you're in a moment, right? right? And everything's happening fast and the moment comes and the moment goes and you're done. You walk away, you're done, right? You either did good or it sucked or <laughs> you just got by, you know? Right. Um, <laughs> mixing in, in the studio is you, it's not a moment. You're, you're listening to the same three minutes about a thousand times and you're putting every single piece of it together, soloing pianos and guitars together, seeing how they match EQ together. And, and you're, you're trying to perfect a three minutes of, of a song or five minutes, whatever you want to call it. And, and, and so that's the main difference. The, the live thing you, you're, you're in the moment. You got to do as best as you can right away, as fast as you can. And then you're done. Here's an example. Right now, I'm mixing a single for, um, I'm in the middle of three records right now. And so right now, one of the things I'm mixing is a single for Mark and Nizzi. Now, here's one song that's, I don't know, it's maybe five or six minutes long. And we've been working on and off of it for two weeks. Hmm. So I initially, when I, when I mix a song, initially have the mix set up within, you know, uh, four to six hours. And then I'll go back to it and do rides and, and then kind of go back to it. So it's usually done within a day and a half, two days. And then nowadays, because we can recall everything completely, mm -hmm. I can go back to something that I've worked on two months ago and, so what happens is oh, there's a, actually there's another record I'm working on, Chevelle Franklin, who's sang back up for Israel. We actually finished mixing her records a few weeks ago. We've been mixing it over the course of the last year, and and it's taken a lot longer than we thought just because of COVID and stuff. But he's actually lit, the producer of that record, uh, Colin Watts, is actually you know he's in England, and he's taking a few weeks to listen to everything and will sometime in February revisit the whole album and tweak things. Wow. And so you can really get microscopic in the mix right. situation. Whereas live is you've got two hours and you're done and you never go back to it. You know, unless you're on a tour, then you have a chance to, to fix things and do stuff like that. But, right. Yeah. Well, one of the things that's changed dramatically with technology is now bands don't even show up for sound check anymore because live they can pull up all their monitor settings and stuff on the computer. Yeah. And there's software for everything and it's just Yeah. They record every show on Pro Tools. Yeah. If you're on tour, which who knows when they'll go back on tour, you know, tours have been canceled for 9 months or whatever it's been and they're not people aren't scheduling stuff don't think until the summer i know and that's even light so yeah it's nuts okay one other thing did you ever feel pressure when you mix an album do you feel pressure knowing that that's going to live forever i don't i mean no i don't i mean i've been doing it so long i, I don't feel that pressure uh that's going to live forever i don't really feel that the, the only pressure i feel when mixing nowadays is just like until i feel like it's right you know and then i I can send it off to producer, and then from there they'll do their subjective changes yeah. to it, however they want it. But I give them the framework. I usually give. I'm usually about ninety five percent done when I send a ref, and then from there it's like we'll turn up the vocal in the second verse or do right. something a little different with the snare or whatever. It's it's things the most common person would probably never hear, right. but they're they represent the personality or the subjectivity of what the producer wants out of the mix. So I, I don't really feel that pressure. Right. Okay, so let me ask you this. Have you ever had a situation where you completely disagreed with what the producer wanted you to do, but you did it anyways because he was the producer? Not usually. What uh, The times that that has happened, okay, there, there's a, been a couple of times that I just thought they were so far out in left field and we didn't match i just would fire myself from the record <laughs> um uh yeah and there there is a distinct time memory it was over christmas and the producer um it was a record and i, I won't say the name you'll know who it is but um <laughs> 
uh, <laughs> I actually, it was around Christmas and they, they, they want, they were chasing after, uh, it was right around and Ab- Ashley Simpson record came out. Right. Okay. And so it was about 10 years ago. So, and they were chasing the sound. Right. Right. And the tracks they had given me were nothing like that, which was a common thing in CCM is where, at least back then is where they would send you all these tracks and then they would go, Hey, I want it to sound like TLC or Beyonce, or (laughs) I want it to sound like, um, I tell you what, in the late nineties, almost every record Christian, Christian female record was supposed to sound like Alanis Morissette, you know? (laughs) So they would send you all these tracks and they go, I want it to sound like this, but then all the tracks they sent you sounded nothing like, the right. reference they're giving you, right? right? So after one or two reps, uh, this particular record, I just called the guy back. I called the A&R guy back, actually. And I said, hey, dude, I, I don't think this is going to work out. I think you'd be uh, better off having someone else mix it. You know, it was just so frustrating. And he's like, oh, okay. All, all right, man. You know, well, thanks. Whatever. And... It kind of shocked him, but like three months later, that A and R guy actually hired me for another record, and he's like, "Yeah, man, I really respected you when you fired yourself off the record." And so, <laughs> that's always a classic example that I always remember. So it's only happened a few times, but did you ever hear the finished version of the other mix? Honestly, even the artist came. I talked to the artist couple of years later and she said the same thing she's like man i thought it was so cool that you had gotten out of that record because it sucked i just think it's funny that they they buy red paint and want a blue house <laughs> exactly that dude <laughs> that is probably the best analogy for that <laughs> that that's incredible we've laughed about this stuff for years <laughs> yeah well the thing is they the and this doesn't happen so much anymore. It was more in, in that eight, 90s and 2000s where everybody was trying to chase right. pop music or whatever was on the radio. And they, so they'd come to, man, there's another session. I was mixing that um, sound stage. And I remember the producer coming with like 140 tracks or something crazy. I remember this. <laughs> and then they're like, he, he gives me all the tracks and I pull up the tracks, kind of just listen to the track. And then he goes, well, I want it to sound like this. And then he played me a track and it was kind of a pop R and B thing. And all it literally had was a loop a bass and like a little keyboard part. There literally was only 20 tracks and then the, their vocals. And I'm like, so you want me to mute 80 of these tracks? <laughs> Make it sound. Anyways, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to get off on the weeds of that because I could dog people all day, but I don't want to. <laughs> we won't use names. We will keep their names out of the press. Yeah. You could talk for years about those stories because they happen yeah. quite frequently. Right. All right. So other than me, do you have a favorite artist that you've worked with? <laughs> other than me. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, I have several, but by far, Steve Winwood. Steve Winwood was the coolest dude to work with. Nice. Um, and, and, you know, younger people wouldn't know who this guy was, but this is a guy. Well, if you ever heard the song, Give Me Some Lovin', right, from the 60s, Give Me, Give Me Some Lovin', yeah. which everybody has heard, right? Right. That was Steve Winwood when he was... 17 or 18 right and so that was the beginning of his career in the 70s he was in a bunch of killer bands with uh all the guy different guys that came out of england you know the rolling stones and uh the um rod stewart and Mm -hmm. all those bands they were all in different bands together um and, and so steve in the 80s did some solo records and did one in the 90s and so I worked on him on a Spielberg f- f- uh, film that he was doing the credit song role for and a couple other things. We worked on a Ray Charles record together. And so what was cool about Winwood is here's this guy who's had so many hits over decades, right? 
Mm-hmm. And he would come into the studio and he would make us coffee. And he, he was just, mm. he was just a regular guy and he could play anything. And he, you know, you'd think when I first met him, I thought, you know, well, he's, he's a keyboard player because he did this album in the eighties that was really big. Um, Arc of the Diver, huge, critically acclaimed record. And there's a lot of keyboards and synths. Well, one day he picks up a guitar, he starts playing the guitar, and I'm like, what? <laughs> he's playing this guitar like crazy. And then a couple weeks later, he jumps on the drums, he's playing the drums. I'm, I'm like, I was like, it was just unbelievable. Oh, and then awesome. after we worked with each other, he actually would come and visit um nathan and i when we were working on other records you just come and hang in the studio bring a bottle of wine or whatever and hang out with us so he he was really cool that's great he was a great guy does he still live in nashville he has a house in nashville but he lives in uh a farm outside of london right well i remember when you were working yeah. with him how much fun you were having that was great awesome so. Okay, so go back through all the albums that you've mixed and give me two or three of your top favorite albums that you have mixed. Two or three of my favorites. Well, I mean, the one, the one, I, by far the one most popular one that everybody would know would be the Mercy Me record that I can only imagine was on. Uh, uh, we mixed that in 99, and um, I think it was on its way to quadruple platinum or something i think the last plaque i received was was triple platinum or something i'm not sure that 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 record um we kind of knew that song was going to be huge even as we we were mixing the record it had it already had that song actually already had a following when bart had signed with um the label and the reason i actually ended up mixing that record is because the original engineer who was mixing it somehow him and the producer or the record guy got in a tiff and got in a fight and uh or they they just didn't get along and so they're kind of stuck with nobody to mix the record and so my manager at the time john sparks knew the label and they were like yeah we could do you a favor we'll we'll mix the record so we mixed the record actually it was a low budget mix we mixed in a studio that was in a church oh wow that i had i I helped design and um and of course it went on to the uh huge record and um after that my i mean i i wouldn't say that's my favorite record but that's one people would all know i'd say my favorite record that i mixed was uh, israel alive in south africa oh yeah um just the the israel is a great musician and the whole team around him at that time there were just great people so the record itself uh for musicianship is amazing right. and it was done live in south africa and the audience tracks from that record are just incredible hmm. and um it was a double record it won a grammy Nice. that year and um it it was really cool that was a great record i i mixed i had to mix it in two weeks um and it was a double record so it wasn't at the time that was i had to move pretty quickly to get it done and uh that was a really cool record that it did um gosh there's so many stinking records <laughs> right um what about the dc talk stuff Oh, well, so DC Talk was kind of, you know, that was uh, Free at Last. I worked on Free at Last. I worked on the cuts that Joe Hogue produced right. and recorded those. It was four or five songs, and that was a lot of fun. It turned out great. Uh, they had a great budget, so we worked in great studios and um, really had a good time doing that. Those guys were awesome to work with and so that actually was my first gold record oh wow cool uh dc talk i have it here actually sitting right behind me um that was my first gold record you know another fun one uh was uh well i was gonna really quickly say we did i mixed michael sweet's first solo record 
uh, Michael Sweet from Striper. Dude, that was a great record. And so it was a lot of fun to work with him and do his, his first record. We mixed that out in A&M Studios in L.A. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ozzy Osbourne was recording in the room next to us. So we got his guitar player to play on a couple solos on a couple tunes that was a blast oh cool and then m more recently um i mixed india re uh christmas record that uh it was like three or four years ago that she did with joe sample just before he passed away and joe sample is a piano legend and um that record is an interesting story because we started it um well, Aaron Lindsay was producing and, and, and was working with directly with India in making the record. And so I started mixing it in the late fall, early fall, uh, a few years ago. And right as I was starting to mix it, Joe Sample had passed away. Oh. And so they put a pause on the record. And so then I resumed mixing the next year in February. And as we started to send the refs back, um, to the record company, her label mates started hearing it and they all, they were like, well, I want to do what I want to do what I want to do it. So <laughs> Aaron went and we got all these people to do duets on the record with it. And, oh, cool. um, so like Michael McDonald, uh, Kim, uh, Tori Brandy and to Tori, who's Tori Kelly. Okay. Tori Kelly, all these people sang on the record. So it's this unbelievable Christmas record. And it's more traditional, you know, with the piano and stuff. And um, so I actually ended up kind of remixing that three times uh, until we, we got done. And um, that's a record I'm really proud of and, and really enjoyed working on, even though I, I never actually met anybody on the record. Right. I only knew Aaron. Aaron and I go way back. But that's awesome. That was a really cool, cool record that I really enjoyed. Gosh, it's so wild because technology has affected music in so many ways. But one of them is now you don't have to be in the room with people. Yeah, you know, I I haven't actually been in, you know, COVID plays into it even more. So I actually haven't been in a studio with people in maybe 18 months like generally everybody just sends me the files and we work here i work with a lot of people in england and um australia and africa and you know the east coast west coast whatever so um they send files and we just go back and forth with emails or texts or phone calls on 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 uh you know updating mixes and stuff and it and in a way it actually works out really well because what happens is so let's say right now i'm working on a record that the producer's in london and so if he flew here and we met in the studio that studio would be new to him mm -hmm. you know you know how you you get used to your own place your yeah. own headphones your own car your own studio and so it works i feel it actually works out really better for everybody because they're listening to I send a ref and they get to listen to it to where they listen to music every day so they know that room they know those headphones whatever they're listening on and then they can make an objective uh, critique of the mix and send the notes back to me what, what happened a lot in the studio like in the late 2000s and and uh, early to you know 210 211 that that era mm -hmm. is I would, people would come and meet me and we would meet at a studio and we'd spend two or three days finalizing mixes and everything. And because they didn't know that room, you know, they were so wild. They're like, Oh, look at the board. Look at these giant monitors. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. They got killer <laughs> coffee and snacks and <laughs> interns and stuff. And then they, as soon as they left, I'd get an email like the next day. Oh man. I really think we need to change this and this and this and this. So they were just, they're actually distracted by the fact of being in the studio or in the atmosphere that was different from them. So now it's, it's a lot smoother. It works a lot. Well, when I'll send a rap to somebody, they're in their studio that they know there. And then they, they'll have a better way to say, Hey, change this or that or whatever. With no okay. distractions. <laughs> <laughs> with no distractions right okay last year uh you were mixing yep. something for me and i called you one day 
<laughs> you were doing that little Hawaiian song I did that I wrote. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you were mixing, and I called, and I said, so what are you doing? And you said you were mixing and said something about your ear pods. And I said, what are you doing, mixing on earphones? So tell everyone what determines whether you mix something on ear pods or headphones versus speakers. Well, in general, I, I, I don't remember that specific day when I was working on, but in general, I always start the mixes on my speakers. Um, I probably do a, at least 80, 90% of the work on the speakers. But I do have a pair of headphones that I've had for 20 years. And what I use them for is when I get to the end, when I finish, when I get done to the end of the mix, right? I want to listen to headphones because there's things, then there's a little more details that you can hear in this specific particular head, headset I have. They're Sennheiser HD 600s, if anyone's wanting to know. But I'll sit there and listen and, and kind of put the frosting on top, mm. whatever, of the cake. Right. and kind of go into details and maybe goose a vocal here and there or a syllable or there's a guitar line that can pop out or something. So I generally use speakers, but there are times I will finish on headphones just for details and stuff. That day that I was listening to AirPods, it was probably something that was going to be, um, you know, a lot of these uh, – everybody's doing live stream now, right? Yeah. Everybody from – rock and roll artists to churches to local bands and everybody's live streaming stuff now because we're at home and all the venues are shut down. So most people are listening on a phone or a laptop or something like that. And so sometimes I'll just listen to it on the phone or the AirPods or whatever to make sure like, Hey, what does this actually sound like where it's going? Right. And that, that actually was something that was really important in the 70s and the 80s is that people, everybody had different types of stereos they were listening to. You know, it was before Walkmans and right. all that mobile stuff. They, people were at home and listening on their own stereos. And the, and the trick was to get mixes to sound great on anything. Right. And so in the studio, they would have the giant monitors that sounded amazing. So you would get your drum sounds and all your cool track sounds and everything. And then you would end up on a pair of Oratones that were crap. Mm -hmm. And then you would make sure that they, you check the mix on those Oratones before you sent it off because you wanted to make sure that even on the crappiest system that the mix still sounded good. Right. So that's kind of where headphones come into play for me is that I finish uh, I use hi-fi headphones and I finish kind of the details of mixes in that. And it also helps me personally to concentrate when I get to the very end. I, I'm not looking at anything. I'm not, I can move my head, but still be in the center of whatever is playing, you know? Right. So. Cool. Yeah. All right. You've mixed thousands of songs, hundreds of albums. Give me a 30 second description of what you think makes a great song. A great song. <laughs> Man, if I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> um, a great song. I, there's pieces to it. I mean, for a great song is a great song. Like if, if you have a great song and it sounds great on a piano vocal or guitar vocal, right. yep. it's a great song, right? The lyrics, the, the uh, hooky chorus you know, a cool second verse or whatever. What makes a great song as far as mix, as far as an engineering producing aspect is that, that all the musical pieces kind of fit together. Um, and it kind of goes back to, we were talking about ADATs and where people weren't listening to the tracks as they're making them. And, and, you know, the, the keyboard, well, for for a mix engineer, producer, or an artist, what makes a great song in production is when all the musicians, all the people are playing together. Like the keyboard player is listening to the guitar player so that when the guitar player does 
a break or a solo, the keyboard player is is complimenting it. Yeah, complimenting. And you know, jazz jazz artists and country artists do this uh, in a natural form, mm-hmm. like they're used to doing this. I mean, if you go see a jazz band, they're playing all playing together, and then yep. someone steps out for a solo, and then they all kind of all just play behind the guy, and then the next guy steps on the solo. And that's kind of, if you can use that kind of analogy for putting together a track of a song, that's kind of what it is. I mean, in Nashville, when, when, a, when they hire a tracking session of, a, you know, drum, a rhythm section, drums, bass, keys, guitar, steel guitar, fiddle, whatever, those guys know going into it, they'll read the chart and they'll go, okay, you take the second verse, I'll take the turnaround, blah, 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 blah. And they all kind of play together. Mm-hmm. And the people that are less trained will tend to stack up parts all in the same register, which makes it really hard for a mix engineer or a producer to get everything to come out clear in a mix. You know, so if everybody's playing chords around A440, the notes on the keyboard or on the guitar, they directly relate to an EQ frequency. So if everybody's playing right in that middle of the keyboard, it's just a layer of sound. You can't yeah. really distinct. But if you got the bass playing down a couple of octaves and you got somebody playing something low pads and then you got the keyboard in the middle, you got the guitar in the middle, the guitar is playing a little higher, strings are playing a little higher. Yeah. Um, that, that's that kind of arrangement. They're actually in, in orchestra that's called arranging. So <laughs> right. they... <laughs> The composer would hire an arranger. The composer would write the melody and in, in the basic structure of the song, and then the arranger would take that and then write parts for all the different instruments so they all layer together, and when they play together, it's one piece of music. And that's a lot of what modern-day en- mix engineers do is they do a little bit of arranging because they'll get all these tracks you have unlimited tracks you get all these tracks and then we figure out how they're all going to go and fit together right. and make a full mix so i don't know if that answered your question but. yeah <laughs> yep all right i came to see you in fort wayne in 2008 mm-hmm. and you laughed at me because you got in the car we, we got in the car to go to lunch and you laughed because I had Journey's new album on CD. You said you were the only person I know who still buys hard <laughs> copies. And this is back in 2008. Yeah, I know. That, that, was that when, is that when the Filipino guy? Yes, that was his vocals? first, his yeah, first yeah. album. Okay, so yeah. I'm an album guy. I'll buy the album, right. put it in my car, drive around with it for three months and listen to it every day. Right. Have albums been rendered obsolete? I mean, in in a way, I think so. Yeah, um, because now you can do, you know, you can do so much with people want singles. It's just singles, right? You got your own playlist, so you basically can make your own album, right? Yeah. You like one song from this person, a song from this person, and you make a playlist. And there are people that are trying. I mean, I've actually worked in a couple re- records in the last few months where they're trying to get back to an experience where the songs are a little longer and they kind of flow together right. uh, as a project. And they're really trying to push for that. I don't know if the public will ever go back to that. but Sounds like a Pink Floyd album to me. <laughs> exactly. So that, what was going on in the 70s was really cool because people would sit down and listen to the whole side of a record. Yeah. And um, that just doesn't, it just doesn't happen now, you know. Right. Everything's so fast and immediate, and they want to hear one song, and they hear another song, and another song. So, I don't know. Maybe there'll be a trend back to that someday. I, I don't know. All right. So, I know you got to scoot here in a minute, but I got just a couple more things I want to run by you really quick. All right. If you mix 10 records, on average, how many of those albums would you say are really good? Not because of what you do to it, but because of the music they provide you. <sighs> Well, it's a little different for I'll I'll give you a disclaimer. So it's a little different because when for me, because when albums get to me now, like it's a different tier of people, right? right. Um so I would say a good eight eight, nine out of ten are really good. 
r- records. Um, I, th- I mean, there was a time in my career where it was maybe 50, 50, right? Oh, wow. Um, just because you had to do some, you, you got to work. So you end up doing records, you know, that, um, you may not necessarily think were good or not, right? right? right. You you didn't like, but it, you know, where I'm at my career now, people actually, I have a, a resume of records and projects that go back a couple decades. So people know what I do. So I, I usually end up with people that want what I do. Right. And, and then I deliver it. So, and, um, and I'm not necessarily cheap. I'm not real expensive, but I'm not necessarily cheap too. So that kind of filters out a, a crowd to right. people that would, you probably have to deal with early, like earlier in my career when you're getting started, you're, you're mixing anything, right. Yeah. Or you're working on anything you can get. So I, I'd say a real high percentage is uh, they're all great. And it's amazing to how many great records that I work on that actually in the broader sense of the world don't ever get heard. You know what I'm Isn't saying? Isn't that interesting? Like I produced a great record three years ago for a friend of mine, Jen Bostic, and it's just a killer record, top to bottom. I mean, I we tracked in a killer studio. We used the best analog converters. We did, I mean, everything from technical, creative. I had the best players on it all her songs were great i mean just a killer record and i mean for her it did really well but it's not necessarily something the general population will ever hear you know what i'm saying right so it 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 is funny how many great records you'll work on and they'll never be gold you know they'll never they'll never be uh widely heard so but they are still great yeah that doesn't that doesn't make them not great, right? Yep. All right. So a couple of weeks ago, you texted me that you told someone our Aerosmith story. You got to share that story. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about the backstage pass thing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I was, t- I was telling somebody what was funny is that I was telling the story to someone a lot younger than me. So they may not even know what cassettes were (laughs) (laughs) but you would take the cassettes because a cassette tape was about the size of a backstage pass yes it was and you would take that cover and cut it off the cassette and then i don't even know how i don't even remember how you did it but you would put your name on there or put all access backstage pass and then laminate it and it looked like the freaking real thing and uh so I remember when we went to Aerosmith in uh, Nashville, you just went right backstage. <laughs> okay, so if you remember, if you remember, I got to remind, I got to remind you of this. You didn't think it would work. Yeah, because <laughs> the whole way out there, I'm telling you, dude, this is going to work. It's not going to work. There, there's no way we're going to get in, and if we get in, there's no way we're getting backstage. So I, yeah. I was excited to prove to you, right, right. that it would that it would work. That I was wrong. So <laughs> what we did is and now what I did is I made those passes, and put my picture and my name, all access, the Aerosmith logo on the back, then the jewel case from the album on the front. Look, you only have to fool the guy checking the pass. You don't have to fool the the road manager. <laughs> well, yeah, once you're past that that yes, the gatekeeper, no one cares. <laughs> yes, and the right. gatekeeper's making ten dollars an hour. He doesn't care. Right. He doesn't care. He's like, ah, oh, yeah, all right. He doesn't want a hard time. So it was funny because that was the night we were at Aerosmith when we ran into Chaz and he asked me to do that award show with Smitty on that following Monday night in Florida. <laughs> so if i was in nashville today would it be thai food or tacos for lunch what are you in the mood for today uh today would but actually probably be a thai day thai day well then tacos for dinner <laughs> yeah definitely thai definitely. food for lunch tacos for dinner yeah i actually found a really killer thai joint right close here well it's 20 minutes away but it's it's really good really really great place cool was that place i sent you food from when you first moved down there any good yeah that was good 
Do you know what was good? Uh, it wasn't necessarily the pad thai, but that thing, what was it called? Amazing or something you ordered? Yep, that was the name of it, Amazing. And it was chicken on a bed of cabbage saturated in peanut sauce. That was that was really good. Awesome. All right, one more question, and then you are out of here. <laughs> Just for fun, you referenced the 70s and 80s and 90s. We've talked about a lot. Of, we covered a lot of ground. Right. Give me three of your favorite all-time albums to listen to as a fan. Um, well, well, music or production. So I kind of lean towards production a bit. Right. And in so I would say yes, nine hundred one two five is one that screams for me. Okay. Um, that was Trevor Horn. So Trevor Horn did a bunch of records that. Uh, in that time frame that I really loved, and yes, nine hundred one two five. And if you listen to it, um, there is just something happening every single second of the song, mm. and and it it goes back to that thing of arranging like the all the sounds are layered, and he just the way he put things together, it was it's just crazy. So I, definitely that, um, and then uh, you know. U2 Joshua Tree okay. is one. And then The Wall, I mean, if you go back far enough, Pink Floyd, The Wall is just an amazing uh, musical journey. And then if you go before that, you know, Dark Side of the Moon is cool too. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on like what you're calling a musical journey, you know. Uh, and then there's a couple other things like Steely Dan, uh, <laughs> yeah. A19 and things like that that are for as an engineer you always go back and refer to like this was you know this was amazing this sounded amazing or whatever um so there's different different things you reference or i reference for different you know different types of situation does that make sense absolutely yeah absolutely well dude i can't thank you enough for taking time to do this today you're welcome bro you're one of the best friends i've ever had in my life and i love you and uh well, thank you man and uh, I will see you soon. Soon and very soon. Soon. You have a great day. Enjoy. Uh, oh, I said Nashville, but we'd have to have Thai food today for lunch in Florida. You're in Florida right yeah, now. Yeah, it, it, would, it would be a Florida day uh, yep. here. And it's actually really nice today. It's sunny and 70. So go enjoy it. Get off the phone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dude. I'll see you soon. Love you. Talk to you later. Hey Rockstar provides digital marketing software and services for your church to generate more interest, create more exposure, and reach more people. Let Hey Rockstar amplify the awesomeness of your ministry. And, as always, Hey Rockstar is a proud sponsor of the Stage Right with John Thorne podcast. My special thanks to you for listening today. Don't forget to share the podcast with someone. My guest next week, Andy Christman from For Him. Thank you, Paul Salveson. Thank you, Hey Rockstar. Have a great week, everyone.